to get going. Hi, everyone. I'm Don Saucy. I'm the Faculty Associate Director of our Teaching and Learning Center, and you have found your way to our professional development series. Our professional development series meets every Wednesday at 12 noon over Zoom. The link that got you into this one will get into the, all the, the ones coming up, um, and we will announce these in K-State today and in a couple other places as well. So we are so glad that you are here. If you want to get a professional development certificate or even be a fellow of the Teaching and Learning Center, my colleagues are going to drop that information into the chat. You can check out that link. We have professional development certificates, both for graduate teaching assistants, as well as for faculty and staff. So please check that out. Um, and we hope you can be there for these. If you can't be here in real time, we also archive these on the TLC website um, for asynchronous viewing later. So if you watch this event and you say, oh my goodness, many of my colleagues need to know this, point them to that website. We'll probably have it uploaded a little bit later this afternoon and they can watch for asynchronous viewing as well. Um, Next week, I always like to kind of do the, the next week before we get to the, this week. Um, this is our first of the spring semester. And next week, we'll have an event on accessibility at K-State by Angie Brunk, one of our colleagues from the libraries. That is one of the things we call a need to know event. So for those of you who are getting the professional development certificate, some of our events are indicated as need to know. Um, next week's is a need to know event because accessibility is something um, that is very important, but might take a little bit of guidance to do it right. So we're very excited about the event next week but we're also super excited for today's event. We have a couple of my favorite people on campus, Mariah Vaughn and Brent Weaver. They'll be presenting on building spaces of belonging, supporting first-year students. And without further ado, Brent and Mariah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. Awesome. Thank you, Don. Yeah, we're excited to be here. Um, so we are uh, together in the same Zoom space because we're together in the same physical space. So we figured we might as well. Um, I'm Mariah Vaughn. I am the Assistant Director of K-State First. Um, I teach one of our CAT communities. It's called the Hope and Resilience Through Fandom CAT Community. Uh, in that, uh, we've got uh, a lot of fabulously nerdy students um, who share similar passions to me uh, in that uh, they have sort of niche interests um, and they're excited to share them. And then I also teach one of our first year seminars, um, Fiction into Film in the English Department. And then we'll let awesome. Brent yeah, uh, I'm Brent Weaver. I'm the learning assistant coordinator with K-State First. I have taught and coordinated a range of different courses with um, our program for first year students, um, mostly our college um, Foundations of College Student Success course for um, first year students. Um, and I also teach a, a learning assistant training. So that's for our peer mentors who work with our program. And I'm so excited to be here with you all today. So we've been teaching at K-State for quite a while. Uh, so I've been teaching since 2011. Uh, uh, since 2015. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so good long time. Um, and have been teaching first year students specifically. Um, I've been teaching first year students since 2013. Uh, and so um, we kind of have recognized trends and needs uh, over the, the course of the work that we've done here at K-State and with K-State First. And so we just wanted to kind of share uh, what we've noticed and what we've learned from our first year students specifically and from our time in the classroom with them. So I, uh, we've got a presentation um, that basically has some of the examples um, uh, from some of the things that we have incorporated into our courses, um, but also opportunities for you all to share uh, some of the things um, that you've done in your classes or that you're excited about and interested in learning more about too. Um, so we were talking earlier today um, that we no longer ever want to do breakout rooms in Zoom uh, because we kind of hate it at this point. Um, so we won't be doing that. Uh, we want to work together in this space um, uh, as kind of a, a larger group. Um, we'll utilize the chat. So if you're not comfortable unmuting or uh, uh, sharing your, your face on camera, that's totally OK. You can share in the chat, too. Um, but we want to stay together in this space uh, as we, we go through and ask for some of your uh, experience and your feedback as well. All right, I'm gonna optimize even though we don't have sound, but um, all right, can everybody see the presentation okay? Awesome, excellent. All right, so we wanna get to know you all a little bit um, and what you're teaching and what you're bringing to the space today. Um, so we'll start with introductions. Um, so just share um, kind of your name, the classes that you teach here at K-State, and what are some of the concerns or challenges that you've seen facing your first year students, um, or if you don't teach first year students specifically, just the students in general. So like I said, I'm Raya, 
So it's Brent, um, some challenges that we've seen as you're kind of typing out um, your responses, um, difficulty connecting with others, unused to rigorous coursework, um, sometimes overwhelmed uh, by the amount of homework or co-curricular activities, um, and then some mental health concerns, some financial concerns. So those are some of the things that we surfaced uh, as sort of major concerns that some of our students have, but we're interested in hearing some of the concerns that you've noticed that your students have or some of the challenges that they're facing. So we'll give you a couple minutes, your name, your classes, and concerns or challenges that you've seen. seen a great range of responses come in. I really appreciate, Clarissa, what you've shared about kind of the, the student population right now, because they were in lock-in, lockdown for COVID, that has had a huge range of impacts that we're seeing in the classroom now. I appreciate you surfacing that. students overwhelmed, some students who prefer not to be engaged or uncomfortable in some of the kind of engagements that we expect them to be, right? So like class discussions and activities, um, more comfortable like sitting back um, and just kind of regurgitating um, facts or uh, kind of those lecture pieces, right? feeling somewhat isolated, right? Not part of the community or wanting to be part of the community. Not comfortable reaching out to ask for help. Awesome. So if you haven't shared yet, um, you can continue to do so. Um, we appreciate you taking the time, but we're noticing a lot of trends uh, and um, issues that we've come across as well. So um, hopefully with some of the um, activities uh, and examples that we have, um, they'll address uh, some of these challenges and concerns um, and some of the discussions uh, and things that you're bringing in as well. All right, so our framework for today. Um, so with K-State First, uh, our work, um, we have kind of three core programs. We've got our CAT communities, which are learning communities where students um, are engaged in three courses together. Um, they're small, um, they're focused on active and engaged learning, our first year seminars, and then our K-State First book program. So really as a foundational piece of what we do, we wanna support students' academic success. We wanna help with the transition to college level learning and college life. And we also wanna connect students to a community of learners to support them from the very beginning. Um, so um, in all we do, uh, we really wanna address a lot of the challenges that you all have surfaced um, and make sure that students are connecting to the community uh, and the support that they need right away. Um, so you can see that with kind of our mission and our vision, um, foster campus community and belonging, raising expectations with engagement and compassion, empowering students and offering lots of different opportunities. So our four topics today uh, and where a lot of our examples are going to fit, 
is within building community, timely connection to resources, um, communication and empathy, and incorporating student feedback and buy-in. Uh, so those are the kind of core things that we're going to talk about. But if there are other um, kind of major topics that you want to connect to, we'll have some time at the end, hopefully, where you can ask some questions or bring in some additional input as well. So to kind of get a sense of, of your interest even further, um, we are interested in knowing two things from you all. And what I'd like you to do is to have your res your responses typed out, but don't hit submit yet until we say go, so we can see everyone's responses kind of waterfall in together. Strategy I learned from Don Saucier himself. So the the first the first question we're interested in is of our four areas we've just shared, um, which is the one that you are most interested in focusing on? And then the second thing is, um, what is a strategy you have used or that you would like to use to address that particular area? So which of the areas and what's a potential strategy you would like to use? And I think Mariah might show back the four areas for us that you can um, see what the options are again that we had to, to talk through. <laughs> so let's get our, our responses typed out but not sent quite yet. We'll give you a couple minutes and then we will Ask for us to waterfall our responses. Imagine that we have nice soothing music playing in the background for you as you're thinking through your responses. Let's maybe take just a couple more seconds here to write out which topic that you're wanting to focus on and a potential strategy you might want to use. And whenever you all are ready, go ahead and type those into the chat. Right, so we're seeing a, a cool range already. Building community, communication, empathy. Building community, community, community and empathy. Check-ins, yeah. This is really cool to see. And I, I think what is interesting to me as I'm looking at y'all's responses, I'm seeing some connections to where you started today with kind of the concerns and things that you've been thinking about, which is really cool to see. Uh, yeah, Mariah, you seen anything that you wanna that you you want to comment to as well? So, so student feedback and buy-in. Yeah, in terms of I think surfacing student expectations. Um, mm -hmm. so it might not be accurate for college level work in post-pandemic. Yeah, Melissa, um, that's definitely something that's come up. Um in my class. Um, and so recognizing kind of what their student, what their expectations are, right? And addressing it, I think early on can be really, really helpful. So y'all. Excellent. Thank you all so much for, for sharing this. And as we go through, um, when it gets to your section is the moment you could be super excited, but throughout the whole time, we'll have hopefully lots of good strategies we can share with you from our perspectives and hear from you all as well. All right, so we're going to start with building community, um, just because this is really foundational for a lot of the work that we do, um, both in our program and in the classroom in general. Um, so some of the examples uh, that I have within my course um, is I have some built in assignments uh, that connect to these specifically. Um, so one of the assignments that I have at the very beginning of the semester is to meet with me in my office uh, during the second week of classes 
and ask me two questions. Um, so uh, this serves sort of a dual purpose. Uh, one is so that students know where my office is because um, it can be a little bit of a challenge to get to because it's kind of deep within the K-State First offices. Um, and then also because then they get to know me as a person um, and not just a sort of um, idea of what a teacher or professor is, right? Um, the two questions are, um, they have to have one that's specifically related to the class itself. Um, and so by that point, we've kind of gone over the syllabus, gone over assignments, we've had some time together in the class. Um, and then the other question can be totally um, random. It can be anything they want to ask me about. So it can be, um, I give them examples, like it can be about my cats. It can be about my nerdy interests. Um, it can be how long I've worked at K-State. Whatever they want to know, uh, they can ask me a question and I'll answer it. And so um, it uh, dives a little bit deeper into the course and the coursework. And if there's things that um, they're still confused about, then they can ask it, ask it directly. Um, and then they get to know me a little bit better as a person as well. And they get to know where my office is. Um, so then hopefully they're a little bit more comfortable coming to this space. Um, I also begin each course um, or each class day with a question. Um, so as students are coming in, um, if they arrive early, I have something up on the board um, that can be related to the class itself that day and what we're gonna be covering in the content, um, or could just be kind of a random question to build community. So um, like, what was your good news this week? Um, if it's around October, what's your favorite spooky season movie? Um, something along those lines. Uh, and then as part of our K-State First uh, classes, we have built in co-curricular events. Um, so these are events where um, we go together outside of the class um, to build community um, and build connections to the content um, related to the learning, but it happens outside of the classroom. And so uh, one of the events is we go to Locked Manhattan. Uh, my students have to do a big project together at the end of the semester. Um, and so we go to Locked Manhattan sort of mid semester, but they're working in their final project groups. Uh, and so they have to um, kind of build their skills and their teamwork skills together to escape um, those escape rooms. They get to know each other. Um, they kind of figure out who's the leader in their group, right? Um, and it, it builds up some of the things that they're going to need um, outside uh, of the classroom as they're working on their final project. Um, but then there's lots of awesome free events that are happening around campus. Um, so I build in assignments uh, that are a part of the course and reflections that are focused on building those connections and community. Um, so like daily questions. Um, I've always got some sort of presentation uh, on the board. Uh, I have a Discord um, so students can answer in the Discord space. Um, and then I kind of talk about it at the, as the first thing uh, in class as well. Um, so sometimes, like I said, it's related to the content. Um, I teach Star Wars uh, as one of the um, books and movies. Um, so I ask what makes R2-D2 such an engaging character? Uh, and then they answered in the Discord and we talked a little bit about that as well. Um, and then connected to some of the film techniques that we were talking about. Um, these are my students going to uh, Locked. Um, none of them escaped. Some of them were happier about it than others uh, this year, uh, but they all seemed to have a good time and they got really connected to their peers. Um, and then this year we also uh, went to uh, the common book, uh, the author talk with George Takei, uh, which was a fabulous experience all around. Um, and George Takei was wonderful. Um, so that was uh, free, right, for all of us to attend together um, and a great time and they learned a lot and they gained uh, a lot of perspective from that as well. They had a reflection assignment that they had to do as part of that. All righty, so some examples that I was kind of thinking about, and the first one also does go back to kind of some of our K-State first expectations. Um, so part of what we do is that community building is a course objective. Um, it is built into what we assess of our courses. And when community, builder, community building is a course objective, then it, it gives you kind of like a, an incentive and purpose to do intentional community building activities and have a way of communicating to your students. So for example, if I wanna do a, a community builder week two, I can say, 
as you all remember from our course objectives, one of our goals is to build community with each other. And so then it kind of helps you establish and, and ground yourselves in that purpose during that moment. Um, another thing that I think about in the, the classroom space is um, how I use partner discussions. So uh, oftentimes, you know, we love a good pair share activity in which you can help students to kind of talk about something as a group and then share it back with, with the full class. But I often build in community builder questions into that, that, those moments too. So maybe we're talking about a book in a literature class. And so I have like two questions related to the book. And then maybe there's one question that's just for them that day. Um, how was your day on a scale of one to five? Or what did you personally think as you were reading this? What was your experience like? Something that's not necessarily just about the content, but is also built into them connecting and, and growing together. Uh, something else that I, I found really valuable for community building goes back to kind of setting objectives as a class. I, I know in a lot of what you all were sharing, we were talking about how we communicate expectations. And one of the ways I do that is through kind of as a class creating what those expectations look like. That then means that we as a class have our own definition for what community is like because it's come from them themselves rather than just me saying, here's what I want out of our community for this space. And luckily that's, that's a strategy that can work really nicely. Whether you have a small class or a large class, there's ways to kind of collaborate and, and work on those, those kind of expectations together. And then similar to when I was, when I was sharing with partner discussions on kind of like check-in reading quizzes that I do with, with my classes, I also build in kind of just community oriented questions there. Um, again, this the example is kind of the same. It's like, how are you doing this week on a scale of one to five? what's one way that Brent can support you this week? So something that's not just about the content and it's another way to kind of get at that information. So some uh, examples to show you. So again, um, is very straightforward here, but community building is one of the objectives for all of the courses in K-State First. And I always list it first just to emphasize kind of that importance there. And then below you can see an example of um, last year's learning assistant community expectations that we drafted together during our first class. And you'll see these are all kind of ideas that came from them in their own words. Things like being an inclusive leader was something that was important to them. And so it's able to capture your specific students and what their um, ways of, of communicating and, and sharing are. So, um, what we'd like to do in between each of these uh, moments we've shared ideas is do a little bit of a check-in with you. And so in terms of community building, um, we'd love to hear from you all on either some of the ways that you've helped your students to connect to each other, connect to you, connect to K-State. Um, yeah, so what are some of those activities or what have been some of the impacts of those activities? Uh, feel free to unmute or you can type those into the chat. I think like I'll as... unmute and share mine if that's okay, Brent and Mariah. Okay, so go for yeah, it. Absolutely. So one thing I've done for several semesters that students really seem to enjoy is classmate interviews. So I assign them in groups of two or three, and you could probably do larger, but it's something they do outside of class. So smaller groups are best for them to coordinate schedules. Um, and I have them um, create and submit questions ahead of time, and then they get together with their classmates and ask each other those questions. And then I have them send a thank you email to their classmates and copy me on it. Ooh. Thanks for meeting. Here's something I liked about you, you know, and I've, it's been really cool because they're copying me so I can give them credit for completing the assignment. Um, but I also get to see a little bit about what they talk about because I see the questions and I see the, um, the email, but I don't ask them to write a report or a transcript. I want them to just focus on getting to know each other, but it's enough that I can tell, yeah, you met and you did this. Um, and we usually do it um, a couple weeks into the semester and then a couple weeks later. And I, I worked with my learning assistant to figure out who to assign to who um, in terms of, hey, these people might really hit it off or they have this thing in common or this is someone they don't normally talk to. So let's get them together to get to know each other as opposed to assigning them to somebody they always sit next to. Um, and that's been really successful in, in the whole class and cohesiveness at the community. Um, and it's been a fun thing for the students to do as well, I think. Thank you, Melissa, I appreciate that. And I want to also comment something that you shared that I really, I want to take and steal from you. I love this idea is by having them kind of email you afterwards. I feel like that's such a nice way of assessing 
that community building piece, which is, I think, often hard for me is like, how do you assess community besides just like the general feel of your classroom? But that's a really intentional way to do that. So I, I appreciate you sharing that, Melissa. Of course, there was there was one semester, I think it was an election year, and several students wrote about, hey, you and I have really different political beliefs, but I still think we could talk and be friends, which is always refreshing to hear as well when, you, when you're, you know, that kind of stuff is going on. So that was really nice. Absolutely. I really like that too, um, because I had one of my students when they, they came in and they asked me a question um, and the question was, how do I talk to people? And I was like, um, you know, like that's like, I can help like connect you to like resources and like how to like get to like other student groups and like things like that. And I was like, but you're like asking like one of the most like introverted people on campus, like, I, like, I don't know that I can give you a step-by-step -step guide necessarily on how to do that, right? But like this like helps kind of like create a space where um, it's a it seems a little less daunting, right? Or you can um, have a conversation and it's um, kind of laid out for you. Um, I like that a lot. Yeah, they. I think they need that structure. Of, it's okay to just ask each other questions and answer them. And hopefully by the end of that, they're just conversing. But since it's an assignment, they can say, okay, well, let's do what we're supposed to. And, and then it results right. in the email, I think is good for assessment, but I also do it because I think it's just, I want to get them in the habit that if they were to conduct an interview with somebody or have a meeting, it's nice to send a quick follow-up email. Hey, thanks for meeting with me. Kind of, it's just a professional development kind of thing as well. Thinking yeah. about developing like soft skills like that and that, that space is incredible. Yeah. And I, I love what you've shared in the chat, Maria, this idea of the value of names and, and learning who your students are that I, I feel like we all have moments where we remember, like if someone knew our name, how it made us feel. And I think that like your T-ball responses that you received really indicate how powerful that was for you. Thank you for sharing that. Very cool, very cool responses coming in. about student belonging. Jack, that's a really, really powerful, powerful thing to get students thinking about from the start and then continuing to reflect that into the field. That's awesome. Cool, thank you all so much for sharing. We'll, we'll keep moving forward and continuing to debrief. That is awesome. Okay, um, so our next um, sort of piece is just timely connection to resources. Um, so uh, there are so many incredible resources and programs uh, available at K-State, um, and it can feel really overwhelming uh, to first-year students and to any student in general. Um, and so one of the things um, that we really like to do um, is to make sure that it feels um, at that it, students are getting connected to it at time of need, right? Um, and so um, we're hitting them uh, at a time when they feel like it's uh, relevant and valuable, even though all of these resources are relevant and valuable at any time during their time here at K-State, right? But this makes it feel a little bit less overwhelming to them, hopefully. Um, so one of the things that I really like to do um, in my uh, first year seminar fiction to film class is I have resource Fridays. So every Friday in class, um, regardless of uh, the content for the class that day, um, I will talk about a different resource available on campus um, for about five minutes or so. So I just set aside five minutes. Sometimes it's a little bit longer depending on what the resource is, um, but it's usually just about five minutes um, talking about a different resource um, that I think is um, particularly timely either as part of the content for my class. Um, so, um, it could be that they might have um, some sort of presentation or paper that's coming up. And so maybe a good resource um, that week because they have a paper that's maybe due in a couple of weeks is uh, the Writing Center, right? Um, so that's timely. That's something that they might need more immediately, right? 
Um, so I talk about something different every single Friday uh, in that class. I also try to get them connected to uh, Hale Library and the library's resources as much as I possibly can. Um, so we have one day in the library that's a library research day. So I work specifically with one of um, the librarians. Um, we go in, we do a workshop uh, in class. So that's the entirety of the class. Um, and uh, the librarians in Hale are fabulous, and they guide us entirely through that um, when we talk about um, critical thinking skills and research skills and incorporating research into the classroom. And then I have them do an Innovation Lab scavenger hunt uh, one day as well. The Innovation Lab is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, there are so many amazing resources in the Innovation Lab. Um, so there's 3D printers, uh, there's the computers that have all of the software for like the Adobe Suite, um, if they do graphic design things, if they wanna make a movie, which they do in my course, right? Um, they have, um, uh, yeah, they have a laminator, which is awesome. They have massive um, printers if they want to do like big, big posters. Um, they have a sound studio. So lots and lots of things available to them. So my students have to go in, um, determine some of the different resources. They have a makerspace um, where they can um, make things with uh, woodwork and lots of other things and sewing machines. Um, I could go on for a long time. I need to stop. Um, but they have to go in, they have to ask questions of the people that are working there, and they have to determine some of the other resources that are available to them that might be relevant for them for their final project in that class. Um, and then I also do a campus-wide scavenger hunt earlier on in the semester where they have to go to some of the spaces on campus and work in um, partner or small groups uh, as well. Um, so one of my resource Fridays that I do early on in the semester, um, like is the Center for Advocacy Response and Education. The reason I do it within, um, sometimes it's the first week, usually it's the second week, um, is because it's within the red zone uh, for students, right? So the period of time in the first four months um, when more than half of sexual assaults on college campuses occur. Um, so I want to make sure that students are aware of this resource, are also aware that this is the red zone, right? So um, there's more than one reason I do this, right? Um, I talk a little bit about bystander intervention, what that is, what that means, um, that CARE has bystander intervention trainings that they can get connected to if they want to. Um, and if the something does happen, right, to them, to somebody that they know, that there are resources to help. Um, so again, time of need is really important when connecting to resources. This is the Innovation Lab scavenger hunt, um, one of the 10 minute creations uh, that my students did, um, which was really awesome. I love to see all the things that they create in the makerspace when they um, are under a timeline, but they make incredible things when they're not under a timeline too, so. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so some of my strategies are, are similar to Mariah's, but from maybe a different lens. So um, Mariah does Resource Fridays. I've framed them as kind of skill discussions or resource discussions so that they happen kind of, kind of uh, at a less um, consistent basis of a day. But what we do during those times, much like Mariah shared with her Resource Fridays, is we intentionally talk through student success skills or campus resources, again, at time of need. Um, so, you know, for, for my class, we also did a library resource day because they are about to do a resource project, um, a research project. And so the person came from the library um, to support us that day in time for them to prep for that, for that presentation and that project. Something else that I do that I found really valuable is that I, I treat our Canvas page as like a hub for them of the information that they need to know, including a, a link to resources, which I'll show you just kind of how that is laid out in a little bit. But more than just having that resource there for them, I also have them engage with it in class activities too. So if we're doing one of our skill discussions or resource discussions, I'll actually have them navigate to that Canvas page and find the resource through there so that they have a good pathway to get to the information that they need to get to. And then the, the other element of this is that sometimes it's hard for me to figure out what is timely for a particular student. And so that's why I really value kind of the one-on-one -on -one connection opportunities, much like Mariah shared with, um, with their office hours visits. And so when I meet with my students for the first office hour appointment, for most classes I teach, we set some sort of academic goal for the semester. And that is a great opportunity and moment for me to figure out what resources might this student need in particular. 
so to, to show you some of the things I was talking about, um, you can see on the left side, there's kind of how I designed my homepage for Canvas. So we have a nice little resources tab for students um, that links out to um, a resource hub for them to get information from. So again, they'll know that this is at this particular location on Canvas, and we will refer that um, refer back to that throughout the semester. In terms of the the one on one, what you see up there is an academic success plan. Uh, this is a document that the Academic Achievement Center at K State has created, and I use it all the time with students. And so you can see, uh, in in this particular case, the student's goal was literally about getting to classes. Um, they were worried that they would be inclined to skip, and so that's where they set all of their goals around. And so in this case, the student was like, maybe maybe what I could do after this, after kind of writing this goal, was I might want to meet with an academic coach who could help me stay accountable. And so that was the way we were able to make that research referral that I might not have known otherwise without kind of walking them through that one-on-one -on -one kind of plan. So those are a couple of ideas from my perspective there. All right. So now's an opportunity for kind of our next check-in, um, timely connection to resources. What are some activities um, or things that you've done and what's been the impact uh, on some of your students? So you, again, you can type it in the chat or if you just wanna unmute and share, uh, we're happy to take a little bit of time. Or if you're just like, yeah, I'm going to steal that and do that. That's cool, too. Ooh, academic databases. Yes. Strategic announcements. I, yes. I hear you on that, Don. Uh, that will connect to something I'm going to share a little bit, but I love that idea a lot. Inviting librarians to speaking classes. I need to learn more about AI tools. <laughs> oh, the first generation glossary. That's an excellent resource. Oftentimes we'll get um, used to using acronyms. Um, and so, yeah, spelling those out um, and making sure that um, we're, we're sharing those with students is really important. Um, awesome. Absolutely. Okay, excellent. All right, so communication and empathy. Um, so, Basically, communicate early and often. Um, so I'll try to reach out um, to my students before uh, they come to campus. Um, usually not super early, but like maybe the week before. I know they have a lot going on, but just as a space to kind of welcome them to K-State, to welcome them to my class, um, to introduce myself. Um, like I mentioned before, I also have a class Discord, so I invite them to the Discord space. Um, not all of them will get connected that way, um, but that gives me an opportunity to um, share some other ways to kind of interact with me and to interact with each other um, before we get started into in the classroom space. Um, and then to use student language as much as possible in syllabus and on assignments. So um, it's been reiterated a lot of different spaces, but use student hours rather than like office hours, um, because this is time that you're setting aside to work with them, right? And then be sure to clarify your expectations for the classroom itself, for assignments um, in various ways um, and as reminders as much as possible. Um, there were a couple times uh, when you know I got frustrated and I had just gone over uh, assignment guidelines and then a student would ask um, about the assignment guidelines and I was like, okay, that's fine. Um, I'll do it again and then um, I'll make sure like it's shared in a PDF. It is shared online on my Canvas page, right? Um, but 
um, it is there as much as it possibly can be, right? Um, so this is um, the first page of my syllabus and the first page of my schedule. Um, so for example, rather than like student learning outcomes, I have language that's like by the end of the semester, you will be able to. It's the same thing, right? Um, but it just makes more sense um, from a student perspective. Um, the very first page um, is all the ways that students can contact me if they have questions or they want to get connected to me. Um, and it reiterates that I really do want to help them as much as I possibly can, right? And then I want them to ask for help and advocate for themselves. Um, so I make it as easy as possible for them to do that. Um, and then uh, I try to break down how class will work, um, how I update modules that I'll be using Canvas. Um, the first day of class, I show them how to use Canvas and how to get connected to it if they haven't done so already, um, because that's the way um, that the class is organized. Um, and so I want to make sure uh, that that expectation is clear and that everybody knows how to access it um, as best they can. Um, so this is an example of one of my assignments. This is our final film project. Um, I have a PDF, uh, but then I also have all of this information in uh, my Canvas page. Uh, and then I have um, rubrics as well. Uh, so I want to know, I want them to know um, exactly when it's due, exactly what the guidelines are. I go over it with them in class. Um, this is a larger project. Um, so um, I break it down into kind of smaller pieces throughout the, the semester. And we get started with um, components of it starting at the mid semester point. So like I said, um, we go to like Locks Manhattan as our co-curricular event at the kind of mid-semester point when they've chosen their final project groups. Um, and then there are smaller assignments that kind of build up to this larger piece uh, at the end of the semester. Um, but I want to be as clear as possible about what my expectations for this are um, and have built-in check-in points for them throughout as well. Um, it doesn't always work uh, that they um, do the assignments that are the check-in points, um, but everyone has always turned in the final project at least, so uh, we've gotten there. So so on my end, um, Don was mentioning a little bit ago about timely resource announcements, and so what I would say in terms of, of this communication piece here um, is I send regularized announcements just kind of for clarity and consistency. So my students know Brent's going to email us every Monday, with just a reminder of what to expect for the week. Um, so there's kind of a routine and, and a pattern around there. And I'll show you what those look like in a little bit here. Another thing that I find incredibly valuable, and I, I know this is probably intuitive, but I, I, I spend a lot of intentional time about this, is ensuring that my syllabus, Canvas page, and all of my documents are completely aligned with each other. Um, so that no matter where a student gets information, it's gonna say the exact same thing. And then letting them know the different ways that they can find the information for my class so we can figure out what's the way for them that works best it it might be you know the little tasks bar on canvas it might be a hard copy of my syllabus that they print off in week one um, whatever it looks like i want to make sure that it's consistent across so that they're going to have the same experience no matter where they're getting their information from in my class i also um i value attendance policies in my classes that that emphasize communication and its role so for me, um, this last semester, my attendance policy was that um, I would have a certain number of, of absences allowed if they communicated to me. So the communication was kind of the requirement in order to have absences um, excused. And what that does is it also promotes kind of some flexibility because life is challenging. We have all sorts of unexpected things. Um, I think since 2020, the unprecedented times is always now <laughs> in different ways. And so, so acknowledging that that is at the reality for students and giving them a channel through which to advocate for themselves is important. And then lastly, in terms of kind of like the, the, the communicating of care, um, written and verbal feedback can be both ways of, um, it can be used for both giving feedback and making sure that that is clear, but it can also be a way to affirm someone and to affirm your students. So if I'm giving um, written feedback on an essay, for example, I'll probably also include just like a check-in in that or a an affirmation of something that went really well. Again, another way of using communication that can be really beneficial for our students. So, so like I said, um, here's a little bit of an example of what 
my kind of regularized announcements look like. Mariah is very beautiful with design work that I am not. So I'm a very much kind of like a, a logical organized brain person. So it's it's a pretty pretty um, straightforward kind of a grid that I give them each week of, here's the day, here's what you need to do before class, and here's what you can expect during class. All of which will be subject to change if we need to adjust in the moment, of course. Um, a, a cool thing that I started doing in the past couple of years that has saved me a lot of um, mental space is that once I have my syllabus set, I pre-schedule my announcements on Canvas for the entire semester. I obviously go in and kind of update them if we change curriculum stuff, but that way, like it's set before I get to the semester. It's not something that I have to worry about during the moment, but can still have a pretty big impact on students um, in terms of feeling on the same page with me and, and knowing what is being expected of them. So that's one strategy that I use that way. So, so another time for a check-in with y'all in, in terms of kind of the communication and empathy um, that we've been talking about, either what are some activities you've used and, and what might've been the impact of those, those activities? And reading your comment, Chase, yes. <laughs> Ryan Silvis is a model for us all. <laughs> Such beautiful design. Um, and Melissa, uh, some stu most students do know how to use Canvas, uh, I've found. Um, some struggle a little bit because um, it's not um, the same across the board in terms of how all professors or instructors are using it. Um, so a comment that I got a lot from my students was that like mine was really, really organized, um, which great, I tried really, really hard to make it so, <laughs> um, and others just weren't. Um, so like, I think they know kind of how to access it, how to navigate it for the most part, um, but I don't know that they know individually class by class what the expectations are because I don't know if that's being made clear by the various instructors who are are using it, right? Um, and so and some don't use it all that much and that's fine. It might not be the thing that they necessarily want to use for the majority of their class pieces, um, but I use it a lot. And so like I make those expectations really clear in my class. I love what, what Don shared in the chat about having students participate in making those class announcements. I think that's a really good way, not only for kind of the communication piece, but also in terms of student buy-in as well. I love that. Clarissa also uses announcements. Um, and I appreciate what you've shared here too, that not only are you using the announcements, but you're also kind of teaching them what to expect with the announcements, um, kind of preferences, email or text and walking them through those settings. That is that is so important. And, and you're so right. Most students, while they might be familiar with Canvas, like Mariah said, they probably not checked out the settings before. And so that's a huge, huge point. that's a great perspective as a student that it, that you found that that's been so helpful. I, I, as a student as well, really value kind of whatever the form of regular communication is that I can expect, whatever it looks like ends up being so helpful for me. Agree with you. And then, yeah, Greg mentions one-on-one -on -one meetings um, for empathy, if it works for your schedules. And that's actually a really great segue Absolutely into our is. final, uh, kind of our final um, piece, which is incorporating student feedback and buy-in. Um, and if you have other things that you wanna um, add into the chat uh, for the last section, that's great. Um, but I know we've only got about 10 minutes left, so we wanna um, make sure we, we kind of finish up here. So with incorporating student feedback and buy-in, um, like I said, um, I have a, a check-in uh, kind of that second week, um, that's an assignment, but this year, um, this past semester, I did an additional one-on-one uh, um, -on -one check-in in, in uh, at the mid-semester point. 
um, which was new. Um, and it's because I had so many students who were struggling in lots of different ways. Um, and so there wasn't um, really one thing that I could pinpoint that um, I could address like in the class um, itself. Um, and so I wanted to be able to check in with each of my students individually. And I recognize that I can do this because my class is small. Um, so I have the opportunity and the time where I can check in with 20 or 22 students. Um, and not everyone can do that, um, but it was really powerful. Um, and it allowed me to kind of address individual concerns and to figure out um, kind of what was going on in my students' lives uh, and how I could um, kind of pivot certain things moving forward uh, in my class at that mid-semester point. Um, so I'll probably continue to do that. Um, uh, I think students will probably continue to struggle um, a little bit. Um, so I'll have that as uh, another built-in kind of one-on-one -on -one check-in point at the, at the mid-semester. Um, in terms of incorporating kind of broader feedback, um, I have um, surveys um, that are a little bit more formal. I have a, a mid-semester survey of the course um, and you know some of my teaching practices um, so that you know I can uh, address those and change things um, as needed. Um, but then I also have some more kind of informal check-ins as well um, on my Discord um, as like some of those kind of uh, uh, before class questions um, throughout the semester as well. Um, so my Qualtrics survey, um, I talk about kind of my weekly modules that are on Canvas, um, whether they're clear, um, whether students are kind of understanding what's due, um, if they're able to finish the homework in a timely manner, if they've gotten to know their peers. Um, and if they disagree, they have to tell me why and what suggestions they have. Um, so they can't just go through and be like, um, I strongly disagree and not offer anything um, as kind of a feedback point for me. Um, and then, beyond that kind of other suggestions to build our class community, what's been engaging so I can kind of continue to do that. Are there other things that I can improve? Um, are there other resources that they really wanna know more about um, that I maybe haven't covered up to that point? And they might already be built into the resource Friday, but I wanna make sure that if they're not, I can get to those as well. Um, for the Discord, um, I've got kind of community building pieces and then I have class specific pieces. So like um, community building, um, some kind of general expectations. I've got a homework help channel, um, a good news channel, some school events that are general and outside of the classroom. Um, if they've been making things and they wanna share, if they have ideas for self care, they can put that in there. Um, and then each week I have specific things for the content of the class um, so they can go to that week and know that that's where we're working within the Discord um, during that week specifically. So I, I do a lot of similar things to Mariah. So kind of a like a, a sum up of what I was hearing Mariah share is there's a lot of value to incorporate regularized student feedback. So that we don't just wait for the T-Val as our only kind of moment where we hear from our students, but build them in kind of throughout the process. Uh, so, so one kind of idea that I've started embedding more and more into my teaching is regular checks at the ends of discussions or activities, and even can be doing these through technology, like Mentimeter, if anyone has used that before, and I'll show you an example of what it is. But if, in case you haven't heard of Mentimeter, it is like an online platform that is allows students to interact and engage with questions. So it's not just a like a stagnant presentation, but rather something that adapts and changes based on students' feedback. So that can be one way to get really quick feedback, whether you have a class of 20 or you have a class of 200 um, in this kind of online technology form. And then much like Mariah, I do a structured mid-semester check-in process. And... Um, kind of how that works for me is they 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 take the feedback much like a TVAL. I review it and then the next class session, I tell them what I learned from it. And I think that there's importance there so that students see that not only is is my instructor taking my feedback, but they they can tell me literally what they heard from it. And here are the changes that they're wanting to make based on the feedback I have. So um, doing the feedback, but then also kind of summarizing for them what I learned and, and thanking them for taking the time to give me that feedback um, and for using their voice. Another way in terms of, of this overall idea of, of student buy-in is, is about student choice, giving students choice in their learning. 
And so I, I incorporate this in different ways. This semester, I tried for the first time um, an assignment where students actually created the rubric that I would use to grade them. I was super nervous for this and it went incredibly well. So basically this was for the last project. So this was not like a, a week one assignment, but it was after working together for quite some time and, and knowing what we expect. Students got kind of an outline of a rubric from me and I asked them to actually fill in, what would you like me to grade you on? And what would it look like to earn an A, a C or to fail in that criteria? It was a huge moment of critical thinking for them, but one that I saw a huge, huge amount of reward both on their end and then also mine and making sure we were we were meeting the objectives of what we were talking about. Um, additionally, sub, I, I like to let students have like a little bit of choice in terms of the content that they're learning about, whether it's they're choosing a book to read for the class or whether it's just ordering what order they want to get through the material that I have planned. Something that allows them a little bit of control or agency in choosing kind of what the, the focus is. Much like Mariah sharing, like they might update resource Fridays based on something that students want. Same kind of thought process here. And then the last thing, um, I think it was around this time last year that Tracy Brimhall, I wanna give her credit, gave a really cool idea to me of using syllabus ambassadors. And so what this essentially is, is that every week in my class last semester, one of my students was the ambassador. And their role every single class period was to tell us what work would we do for the next class session, rather than me being the one that shares that in the class period. I found that it got a huge amount of student buy-in because they knew that they were each going to be responsible. So not only do they pay attention to their peers really well, they also knew exactly where to go to get process, to get information, because they knew that they would have to do it eventually as well. Um, so that was a, a really good way to think about not only communication, like we talked earlier, but student buy-in in that moment too. So this is an example of Mentimeter that I was talking about to y'all. So essentially this is a, a little template. This is not one I actually used, but for example, you can type a question, you give your responses, and then as students contribute feedback, those bars would grow and, and populate based on student responses. Um, the platform is also very, very instructor and student friendly. Um, with instructions on how to access and all of those kinds of great things. So just wanted to plug that as a potential tool um, that you can incorporate. And then lastly, this is an example of the, the rubric assignment I was telling you all about. So like I mentioned, I gave them a, an outlined rubric that they started from, and then from there, they would build their more specific responses. Um, this wasn't the full of their final project. Um, there was other aspects to it, but it at least let them choose how the assignment would be graded. Um, and I got a lot of positive feedback from my students on how that went for them. As I head too far. All right. Awesome. Well, we've got about three minutes, so we can talk about kind of incorporating student feedback and buy in, um, or if you just have kind of general questions for us. Um, we're happy to take those as well and I can stop sharing so we can see your lovely faces. So, yeah. I'm hearing a lot of love for Mentimeter in the chat. I love that. It's so fun. <laughs> you can do so much with it. And yeah, and Claire, so that's a good good um, context sharing. You do get two free pulls to the system that are active at any time. Once you go over that two, then you either have to purchase an account or delete them. But it's really good for little bits of little bits of time there. I have a question for you, Mariah and Brent. Um, yeah. What do you love most about first year students? Um... It's a great question because it's like where to start. It's an amazing population to teach. I guess I would say like from a, a teaching perspective, and this, this is probably also um, teaching courses with K-State first, but I feel very empowered to be intentional and clear with the transition to college um, in ways that I have not always felt that same level of permission, if that makes sense. I, I think it's something we should do in every class, right? But I feel very empowered to, to support in that way. I also think they're excited to learn, um, which is fun. Um, like it's fun to teach people who are excited to learn. <laughs> um, and like, 
I mean, there's a there's certain points where, you know, maybe they get a little bit jaded or they get a little bit overwhelmed or, um, you know, things are happening um, and it doesn't feel like they're prioritizing your class or whatever. Right. Um, but I think for the most part, like they they want to be here and, and they want to they want to learn what you're teaching and, and they want to figure things out. And um, yeah, it's it's just a great a great population to to work with I think so yeah working with first year students is it's fabulous absolutely all right well we are about out of time so please join me in thanking Mariah and Brent for their wonderful presentation today thank Glad you to be all for here. engaging with us and uh, Brent Mariah, one of the things that I do want to kind of point out that I really do appreciate is all of the practical recommendations that people can use in their classes tomorrow to help do these kinds of things. So I, I really appreciate that in particular for what you've done. Um, for those of you in the audience, we have a post-event survey that my colleague can make available in the chat. So please check that out. If you're looking for a professional development certificate, we have that possibility too. My colleagues will put that in the chat. And I want to remind you that our professional development series will be every Wednesday at noon over Zoom, also recorded for asynchronous viewing on the TLC webpage. So let your colleagues know. Um, next week, Angie Brunk from the Wonderful Library is going to be talking about accessibility at K-State as a need-to-know event. We hope that we see you there. One more time, thank you so much, Brent. Thank you so much, Mariah. You guys are awesome. Thanks, Al. Take care, y'all. <laughs>